So, you must remember, of course, that the word play and the word game have many levels of meaning. We are accustomed to use the word play in opposition to work and to regard play as trivial and work as serious. Very largely, a game or a play is something in, associated in our minds with triviality. You're only playing with me, says a girl to a suitor. You're not serious. How serious do you have to be? When does one get serious in a flirtation? When do we say, this is getting serious? When you're holding hands, playing footsies under the table, kissing, petting, sleeping together, married and babies. Maybe that's serious. <laughs> but uh, we also use the word play in a non-trivial sense. I went to hear Heifetz playing the violin. Was that a trivial matter? On the contrary, the very highest kind of art form, still play. I say too, when I do philosophy, like I'm doing with you, this is entertainment. But in the sense, perhaps, I hope, of your listening to someone play a musical classic. I'm not being serious, but I am being sincere. The difference, you see, between seriousness and sincerity is that seriousness is someone speaking in the context of the possibility of tragedy. That there is a situation where things might go absolutely wrong. And then I put on the expression which is serious. That's why soldiers on parade are always serious. They don't laugh. And when they salute the flag, they put on a stern expression. That's why in courts of law and in churches, people don't normally laugh, because all that we deal with here is very important, a matter of life and death. But the fundamental question must be, be brought forth, is God serious? And obviously the answer is no, because there's nothing to be serious about. I said also that the self, as conceived, the supreme self, was quite useless, that it was immaterial, it doesn't matter, because it transcends all values of what is better or worse, what is upwards or downwards, what is good and bad. It so weaves the world that the good and the bad play together like the black and white pieces in the game of chess. So, play is deeply the sort of thing children like to do with deep absorption and fascination to drop pebbles into the water and watch the concentric circles of waves. Or mathematicians. Mathematicians, you know, uh, especially what we call higher mathematicians, are entirely lacking in seriousness. They couldn't give a hoot in hell as to whether what they're doing has any practical application. They are working entirely on interesting puzzles and working out what they call elegant and beautiful solutions to these puzzles. And they can go on and on like that in absorbed meditation, spend their whole lives doing it. Or consider the musician, practicing, working out interpretations. What is he doing? He's making series of interesting noises on instruments. Now, what do people like to do when they don't have to do anything? Well, as far as I can make out, as you look all over the world, they like to get together and do something rhythmic. They may dance, they may sing, 
They may even play games, because, say, in playing dice, there's a certain wonderful rhythm to shaking the, uh, the cup and rolling the dice out on the table, or dealing cards, dip, 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 you know? All the things that people like to do and think about these rhythms. Or some people like to knit. And this is, this is a, a rhythmic thing, you see? Others just like to breathe. There are all sorts of ways in which we love to do this. Now, you see, our very existence is a rhythm of waking and sleeping, eating and moving, and that's all we're doing. And just consider what we do every day. What's it all about? Does it really mean anything? Does it go anywhere? It's just because we want to keep on doing this kind of a hoop da So you can get a certain vision of life where everything is seen to be a complex pattern of rhythm. Dances. The human dance. The flower dance. The bee dance. The giraffe dance. And these are also comparable to various games. Poker, bridge, backgammon, chess, checkers, etc. Or to various musical forms. Sonata, fugue, partita, concerto, symphony, or whatever. And that's what this all is. It's jazz. You see? This is a big jazz, this world. And what it's trying to do is to see how jazzed up it can get. How far out this play of rhythm can go. Because that's what we all come down to, you see. We're going this in every conceivable way. So then that is why you see this, this fundamental view that the world is play. Now, let's examine the rules of this game. The basic form of the cosmic game, according to the Hindu view, is the game of hide-and-seek. Or you might call it the game of lost and found. Or again, now you see it, now you don't. In examining the nature of vibration, we find a very peculiar thing. If you represent vibration as a wave motion, you will notice that there is no such manifestation as half a wave. We do not find in nature crests without troughs or troughs without crests. No sound is produced unless there is both. Both the, the, the beat, as it were, and the interval between. Now, this wave phenomenon is happening on ever so many scales. There is the very, very fast wave of light, the slower wave of sound, then there are all sorts of other wave uh, processes. The beat of the heart, the rhythm of the breath, waking and sleeping, the peak of human life from birth to maturity and down again to death. And the slower the wave goes, the more difficult it is to see that the crest and the trough are inseparable. So that we become persuaded in the game of hide-and-seek that it is possible for the trough to go down and down and down forever and never rise again into a crest. Forgetting that trough implies crest just as crest implies trough. 
There is no such thing, you see, as pure sound. Sound is sound silence. Light is light darkness. Light is pulsation. And between every light pulse, there is the dark pulse. And so the Hindu image is that the self eternally plays a game of hide and seek with itself. Hindus calculate time in kalpa units. And the kalpa is 4,320,000 years. And so they say that for a period of a kalpa, the worlds are manifested, or any particular universe, not all universes, but let's say any particular galaxy or, what, or whatever it may be, world order of some kind. Don't take this too literally. Don't take these figures as being some sort of divine revelation as to making predictions and prophecies. They're symbolic figures. So for one kalpa, the world is manifested, and that period is called in Sanskrit a manvantara. And during that time, the Brahman plays hide. And he hides, it hides in all of us, pretending that it's us. And then at the end of the Kalpa, there comes the period called Pralaya. And that also is a Kalpa long. And in that period, the Brahman, as it were, comes out of the act and returns to itself in peace and bliss. This is a very logical idea. What would you do if you were God? Isn't the whole fun of things, as every child knows, to go on adventures, to make-believe, to create illusions, that is to say, patterns. And so, uh, for some ways of talking in Hindu thought, this world is the dream of the Godhead. The Godhead is, of course, represented as in a way two-faced. With one face, he dreams and is absorbed in the dream world. With the other face, he is liberated. In other words, what you have to understand correctly is that from the standpoint of the self, the supreme self, the pralaya and the manvantara are simultaneous. But put into mythological form for human consumption, they are represented as being in sequence, following each other. But they really happen at the same time. So that one doesn't realize union with the self after death later than a certain time, all references to the hereafter should correctly be understood as the herein, as a domain deeper than egocentric consciousness. That is to say, when you get down to the bottom of the egocentric consciousness, you get to its limit, which is figuratively its death then you go on inwards, the self deeper than the conscious attention. And in that way, you go inwards to eternity. You don't go onwards to eternity. To go onwards is to find only time and time and time and more time and more time, in which things go round and round and round forever. But to go in is to go to eternity. But in the ordinary way, when we are talking about this graphically and vividly, in imagistic terms, we can talk about the everlasting game of hide and seek, which the self plays with itself. It forgets who it is and then creeps up behind itself and says, Boo! And that's a great thrill. It pretends that things are getting serious just as a great actor on the stage. Although the audience know that what they're seeing is only a play, the skill of the actor is to take the audience in 
and to have them all sitting in anxiety on the edges of their seats, or to be weeping or laughing, or utterly involved in what they really know is only a play. So you would imagine that if there were a very great actor with absolutely superb technique, he would take himself in. And he, you see, would feel that the play was real. Well, that's their idea of what we're doing here and now. We are all, the Brahman, acting our own parts, being human, playing the human game so beautifully that he is enchanted. You see what enchanted means? Under the influence of a chant, hypnotized, spellbound, fascinated, and that fascination is Maya.